So let me welcome everyone uh, to this session. Um, this is a second, as I said, in a six week series uh, as part of the Science for Seminaries program. Um, and the program is funded by ECLAS, which is the uh, Equipping Christian Leadership in an Age of Science, um, the grant that's uh, been made available. So um, this, is, this series is around scientific topics that pertain to everyday life. Um, and to make those who are not uh, professional scientists or having access to uh, more scientific fields still, though, need to find spaces to discuss uh, scientific developments that affect our lives and our in government policies um, um, across the board. And in addition, uh, Christians need to know enough about neuroscience and about health and evolutionary science and climate change and catastrophe um, tonight. Um, and so in light of that, and in light of um, the earthquake that uh, just occurred in the last day uh, in Turkey and in Syria, and then thousands of lives that have been lost uh, as a result of that, I'd like to invite us actually um, at this beginning just to take a moment um, and sort of center ourselves in the reality of what we're talking about tonight um, and the impact that it has on people's lives. So I'll bring us to an end when the moment um, comes to a close. Thank you. So as part of this night and this series, um, we are looking to provide resources for seminaries and churches to incorporate um, more scientific awareness um, in educational programs. And so part of tonight is to help people uh, come across and think about um, theological understandings of catastrophe and then of the other nights of uh, the topics that are at hand. My name is Jamie Reeves. I am Director of Academic Development at Serum College, and it's really lovely to have all of you here. Um, so really excited to have um, Roger, Abbott, Roger Abbott with us tonight, um, who is doing science and the theology of catastrophe. Roger, I will let you introduce um, yourself, but in, to invite everyone else to um, check out our website for other short courses and other, um, other sessions that we'll be doing for this series if you haven't yet registered for those. You have on the screen before you, which you can all see, um, th this is me. Um, I have recently retired but nevertheless continue to, to work uh, in conjunction with the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in Cambridge. Uh, I've worked with the Institute since 2012 and specializing in so-called natural disasters. Uh, the reason that I say so-called, I hope will become clear uh, by the end of, uh, of uh, my presentation this evening. I am by uh, training and by profession, a practical theologian. But uh, of course, you can't work at the Faraday without also having some understanding and grasp of, uh, of science. But my primary research cap uh, capability is in practical theology. And with that in mind, I have traveled to the locations of some of the most catastrophic uh, catastrophes uh, in modern history. And uh, the one uh, that I did in Haiti has been uh, captured in the book that I co-authored with uh, the director of the Faraday Institute at that time, uh, Professor Bob Smith, and uh, narratives of faith from the Haiti earthquake. It's a great privilege to come and uh, speak to you and spend time with you this evening. And, and often I learn as much as I, as, as I give in these. So I shall look forward to the, the Q&A afterwards. There is a lot to get through, but I hope we can get through it and, and keep sane as we do so. As we've already been reminded, of course, it's, it's a very salient topic for a day like today and uh, very sobering. And it certainly earths our topic in, in in the realities of life as we reflect upon uh, the situation in Turkey, even as we speak. Uh, 
Um, if you notice the the uh, the bit down in the right hand corner of your screen, that's a capture from an app that I have, one of two apps that I use to capture earthquakes. And all those red dots are where there have been uh, seismic movements, um, uh, basically in the last 24 hours. And of course, we have those two major uh, uh, events that have shaken and, and done so much damage. And it was great to be able to have that opportunity to extend our heartfelt prayers to the thousands who have been bereaved and injured and, and their families. And those figures, I am sure, even by tomorrow morning, will, will, will have grown, uh, grown very substantially. So we're going to look at or, or a case study, as it like uh, for today, uh, as again, uh, it fits in very well with what's happening in Turkey, is what happened in Haiti back in 2010. Uh, I arrived in Haiti at that time as, as a chaplain, actually, to an NGO, and, and I worked there. Uh, I went on two occasions, 2010, 2011, uh, just as cholera had reached, as if the earthquake wasn't bad enough. And then there was Storm Thomas, and then came cholera. Uh, so this was a dreadful period for the people of Haiti, a dreadful suffering. And I worked there as a chaplain. Uh, and uh, and then I was able to go back, having got my post at the Faraday in 2012, I went back there to conduct research, taking a research project with me. Well, science and the theology of catastrophe is, is, is the, uh, the subject that I've been given, and taken as it stands, there are certain inherent difficulties, in fact, in addressing that title. Uh, which science are we going to be talking about? Science is a field within which, of course, there are a large variety of disciplines, each with its own methods of examination and analysis and recording. And a number of these may be relevant to the issue of catastrophe. So we ask the question, which science? Will it be geoscience? things to do with geology, seismology, volcanology, meteorology, and climatology? Or will it be biomedical science, things to do with traumatology, bacteriology, virology, epidemiology, pharmacology, psychiatry? I don't think, but it, it could be astroscience, things to do with the outer atmosphere, astronomy. Will it be social science? things to do with anthropology, social and societal behavior, psychology? Or will it be an interdisciplinary science, such as neuroscience, engineering science, computer science? So there's this vast spectrum of sciences. And uh, you'll realize that uh, when we were told at the beginning of the pandemic, which is uh, my current project, actually, we were told by the government that we were following, we are being led by the science. Well, of course, there are a shed load of sciences involved in understanding pandemics. And a similar thing can be said about uh, each natural hazard related uh, catastrophe. So which science are we going to be following? I've singled and highlighted them out. Geoscience being one of them, the study of everything to do with the physical earth, in this case, mainly with tectonic plates and faults, but not just geoscience. There's social science, and this has a major part to play as well in the sciences of understanding uh, catastrophe. Between 2010 and 2015, as I said, I was involved in research of the catastrophic earthquake that struck the Caribbean island of Haiti. And of course, you may remember there was an even stronger one that struck in uh, 2021. Um, we're going to be focusing on the one that I worked with in uh, the 2010 one. 
It struck at 4.53 in the afternoon on a sunny Tuesday afternoon, just as workers were, were leaving work, going home, and just as school class sessions were changing over, uh, mainly giving way to evening classes. That 35 second shaking of the earthquake with its 52 aftershocks over the following two weeks led to something between 230,000 and 310,000 lives being lost. 300,000 injured, 1.5 million being displaced from their homes and livelihoods. It was, in every sense of the word, a catastrophic event. In fact, one of the most catastrophic in modern times, if it's measured in terms of the human impacts of that, uh, of that natural hazard event. Haiti's geology is quite well known. And in front of you is a very simple map. Um, really giving some of the historic events that have uh, affected Haiti. And uh, you will see down on the, uh, if I can bring up the pointer, down here, this is the fault that we are going to be uh, concerned with. And you will notice that there are two catastrophic events connected with Port-au-Prince, the capitals in 1770 and 1751. Both of those events destroyed the city, destroyed the capital. Of course, it was much smaller then than it is now. And then there was the, uh, the 2010 event. But as I say, uh, it, its geology is quite well known and it has a history of, uh, of seismic events. Just focusing in a little more on that uh, uh, on, on that uh, geoscience, if you if you like, what has a collaboration between geoscience and social science and theology to say to such catastrophes? That's the question. We're the big question, if you like. We're we're asking. And I emphasize the word collaboration because research collaboration is very much the new research focus in geoscience. And both the American Geophysical Union and the European Geophysical Union have uh, made an issue of, of emphasizing, emphasizing uh, the importance of collaboration uh, in, in its, uh, in its uh, projects. So first of all, what does geoscience inform us about the Haiti earthquake? Well, it tells us, as I've already said, that Haiti's geology was well known, but the 2010 event was not expected. Uh, as you will know, earthquakes are very, very difficult to predict. In fact, you can't predict them. But in Haiti, as the map shows, there are two uh, active major faults. There's one in the uh, in, in the uh, in the north, the septentrional uh, fault, and there is one in the south, running uh, east to west, the uh, elegantly named Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault, or EPG, as I call it. It was expected and almost assumed that when the earthquake happened, that it, it was this fault, the EPG fault, that was the, uh, the fault that had slipped and given way. It was expected that that was the case because that fault had been, if you can imagine the cogs, you know, in two cogs locking with each other, and straining against each other. Well, the, the two parts of the fault which rub against each other had been stuck for 260 odd years. And it was supposed that that elastic strain, as it's called, 
must have given way very suddenly for a catastrophic earthquake of this nature to have taken place. So there was this huge uh, elastic strain, but in actual fact, as time went on, it became very clear that the culprit was a, a largely unknown fault, now named the Leogan fault. Leogan being a city that's uh, 30, 40 miles uh, west of Port-au-Prince, uh, a low-lying uh, city, uh, the ancient voodoo capital of Haiti, in fact, but uh, uh, it was it was uh, ninety percent destroyed by by the earthquake, and and there was a fault there that uh, was a spin-off, if you like, from the main EPG that was concluded to be the one that uh, that was to blame. So what does geoscience inform us about the Haiti earthquake? Well, it informs us that there's no precise warning of an earthquake. If ever you hear someone say, there's going to be an earthquake in blah, 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 I'll always take it with a pinch of salt. You cannot give precise warning of an earthquake. All you can do is say that there are intimations of risk. And I've, I've put this slide up because this is uh, Professor Eric Calais, and, and he's someone I've come to know and to respect and admire as a geologist. Um, we know that, and, and he's gonna have a, a, a bit to tell us about the, the geoscience in particular. We know the geology well. We know that there were at least two uh, catastrophic events uh, in the past in 1700 and in 1751 on the EPG fault, and then there were two in the, in the north. This is Professor Eric Calais, who in fact did his PhD uh, in, in, in Haiti, in, in his fieldwork research in Haiti as a geologist, uh, exploring the, uh, the seismicity of the country. Uh, and he did that back in 19... 84, uh, just, just to try and note the dates, if you like. He was there in 1984, and having done his PhD, he, he, did, he, he returned to Haiti on numerous occasions as a professional research scientist. So what does geoscience inform us about the Haiti earthquake? Eric Calais spent years in Haiti producing empirically based warnings using measurements from geological deformation to calculate stress levels from tectonic plate movements. Went out there and put sensors into the ground and was able to detect these movements. To cut a long story short, he and his colleagues wrote a paper based on his research and they concluded, and I quote, similarly, the Enricolo fault in Haiti is currently capable of a uh, maximum 7.2 earthquake if the entire elastic strain accumulated since the last major earthquake was released in a single event today. And they published that article in 2008, note the date. So in a sense, you could understand why when it did happen, they thought, ah, the elastic strain has, has suddenly given way. Having published that article, he circulated copies of it to members of the Haitian government, to members of the United Nations, to the various NGOs, and there were 10,000 of them in Haiti before the earthquake, and to businesses, and everyone ignored what he said and how, what he concluded. And then at 4.53 on January the 12th, 2010, two years after the publication of that data, a 7.0 earthquake struck with all the devastation that it did. So there was Calais saying, the risk of that earthquake happening is high. 
and everyone ignored the warning. Now, it's important for me to say, and for you to understand, that the earthquake did what earthquakes do by creation. So there is no proof of catastrophe about that event from geoscience. If you want to look to geoscience to find uh, evidence, empirical proof of catastrophe, there is none to be found in geoscience. Geoscience tells us that those faults did what faults do and do regularly. Uh, and they do that by virtue of the fact that they are divinely created to do it. Of course, the geoscience wouldn't include the divinely created. They would say they would do it because they're just doing what earthquakes do by nature. So what has a collaboration between the social science and theology to say to catastrophe? So we move from geoscience now to social science. And we're still with, uh, with Eric Calhay and his colleagues, interestingly enough, although he is not a social scientist, he is a geologist, a geoscientist. But nevertheless, he continues his work in Haiti and he is continuing as much as any researcher can continue with the state things are in Haiti at the moment. He is continuing to work and, and carry out projects out there. And the current one is what is called a socio-seismology experiment in Haiti. And uh, when I, uh, in talking with, with, with Eric, learned that he was doing this, uh, my eyes lit up and uh, I said, can we, can we talk? In fact, I went out to Paris uh, to the university where he's uh, a professor out there. And uh, I sat down and we had two, three hours conversation together. And I said to him, I want, I want to share something with you. Uh, you know the kind of work that I do and have done in Haiti. And I know the kind of work that you've done, which, which I respect enormously. But now you're doing this socio-seismology experiment in Haiti. And you will know that Haiti is all but 100% uh, religious. Um, you're either Catholic or Protestant or voodoo. And if you're voodoo, well, you're Catholic as well as voodoo. I said, what if we were to collaborate? And so I worked with the churches in Haiti and the church leaders in Haiti who are key social actors for disseminating information. And they need to learn, they need, the people of Haiti need to have, in whatever way they can understand it, what you are saying, what you are warning about the geoscience of their country. And I really felt that this kind of collaboration could have been very interesting. Eric, bless him, being the uh, archetypal secular uh, Frenchman, uh, smiled and said, I've got difficulties with that. And it has to be said, his principal difficulties were over the assumption that every uh, Christian took a young earth view and had no truck or time with anything to do with uh, evolution, even in a geoscience, uh, geoscience uh, perspective. I tried to assure him otherwise. Uh, the clear, the nearest we got was he would be very happy for me to do my work. He would do his, and we could share our our our, our results, and then even share the work we were doing. But I really felt that that kind of collaboration could actually be very life saving. 
But what does social science inform us about the Haiti earthquake? If the geoscience has fascinating theological linkages, the social science has alarming theological linkages. As we begin to take in the huge damage and suffering incurred to the human population, and also analyze the link causes between the geophysical aspects and very human factors involved in the matter of particularly, for instance, construction. If we compare these damages with other earthquakes, for instance, take earthquakes that happened in Japan in 2011, then the damage caused in Haiti is obscene compared to the small amounts of damage that happened with that 9.0 megawatt um, seismic active activity in, in Tohoku in Japan in 2011. And I just remind you, and I, I won't go through them in detail, but I'll just remind you of the figures you can see before you on the screen. And just try and absorb for a little nation like Haiti what those figures actually represent as far as uh, almost destroying your country as a country. Here is a catastrophe in the real, real sense of, of the word. And you look at homes, you look at education establishments, you look at hospitals, you look at government ministries, all were wiped out in 35 seconds by an earthquake doing what an earthquake does. The US Geological Society figures show that 98% of total deaths from earthquakes globally during 2010 occurred as a result of the Haiti earthquake. They record 316,000 deaths from the earthquake occurring out of a global total of 320,120. That's a huge percentage. Included in that same total were the global, were, were the 523 deaths that occurred as a result of an earthquake in Chile that was 8.8 .8 in magnitude that happened just a couple of months later in 2010 and was 500 times stronger than that which took place in Haiti uh, the previous months. So that helps us get an answer, begin to answer why the earthquake turned into a catastrophe. And the main reason is poor construction. But allied to poor construction is poor education and poor employment. Immediately after the earthquake in Haiti, Roger Billum, uh, a geologist, went out uh, to Haiti and, and he wrote a report. And he said, earthquakes, quote, in recent earthquakes, buildings have acted as weapons of mass destruction. Now, when it comes to the business of construction in Haiti, there are massive complications. And I've just listed a few of the factors that play into the way construction is carried out in Haiti. Land ownership and tenure, extraordinarily complicated. Family planning and sexual behaviors. So you have uh, huge numbers of uh, you have very, very large families that need to be housed. You have the issue of marital status. Many people in Haiti are not actually married. They are in plassage. They are cohabiting. 
with all the complex difficulties of home ownership that come with that. There's huge unemployment. So you have uh, problems with income generation. And if you have no income, you can't really afford to build properly. And then there's the dreadful political and commercial corruption, which is so rife and devastating for Haiti. You have financial destitution, you have problems, real problems of education. And all of these fact factored into the issue of construction leads to the kind of damage that you see on the slide in the photograph before you. Tat dat, it's the sort of major uh, database, if you like, for, uh, for earthquake information. And it has been found through CATDAT, I'm quoting from this, uh, from this article in, in Nat Nature Hazards um, in, in 2013. It's been found through CATDAT that, there, that where secondary effects of earthquakes do not occur, nearly 100% of deaths are due to building collapse in earthquakes with over 1,000 deaths. And in the photograph, I've put that in, you have two buildings. They're actually both new buildings. You have Digicel, which is the major telephony and uh, internet provider and so on in Haiti. And you have the Turgo Hospital, which was uh, a very recently built four story, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, building. And this is what that building was reduced to by the earthquake. Contrast it with the Digicel building, which had virtually no damage at all. And where does the difference lie? It lies in the methods of construction. So this is the kind of problem that we are dealing with in, in Haiti and which is killing people when earthquakes take place. So what does social science inform us about the Haiti earthquake? It's a catastrophe. And why is it a catastrophe? Well, it's a socially anthropological catastrophe. This is a quote from an anthropologist, Anthony Oliver Smith, that I, 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 I've been particularly struck with. He, he's not Christian in particular, but he says, moreover, disasters are far more than catastrophic, catastrophic events. They are processes that unfold through time and their causes are deeply embedded in societal history. As such, disasters have historical root, unfolding presence, and potential futures according to the forms of reconstruction. In effect, a disaster is made inevitable by the historically produced pattern of vulnerability evidenced in the location, infrastructure, socio-political structure, production patterns and ideology that characterizes a society. And then you have the messy business of politics. Uh, the late Paul Farmer, someone for whom I have huge respect, um, wrote this book, Haiti After the Earthquake, back in 2011. And he said this so pointedly, tragically, this Haitian history of liberty and self-determination has drawn two centuries of political and economic ire from powerful countries, resulting in policies which have served to impoverish the people of Haiti. Very, very powerful and, and, and very, very true statement. We also have global politics as a factor, uh, very much involved in why a hazard like an earthquake can turn into a catastrophe like it did in Haiti. And I quote again, uh, however, structuring the however, structuring the poverty 
and equality that destabilizes the country is a world system consistently applying pressure and draining Haiti's resources. The US occupation in 1915 set the stage for dictatorships, dependency, massive urbanization and centralization in Port-au-Prince. This was followed by the application of neoliberal economic policies since the transition to democracy began in 1986. Another telling statement. So what has a collaboration between geo and social science to say to such catastrophes? Just a few concluding remarks before we move on to the theology. Conclusions for catastrophe mitigation. What can be done to help mitigate uh, earthquakes turning into catastrophes? Well, first of all, we need a scientific mentality that is embraced Christianly. It's very interesting. There's a very growing movement now. Uh, hashtag no natural disasters. And uh, the, the people, all kinds of people getting involved in this who are increasingly convinced that there's no such thing as a natural disaster. They are always in some way, shape or form products of human uh, intervention and human action, human decisions. Now we need a scientific mentality to embrace uh, these events in a Christian way. So we need scientists who are collaborating with Christians. We need Christians who are being good scientists. We need scientists who are good Christians. We need science being talked about in the church, not, not run away from not being a taboo subject. And then we need socioeconomics of a safe society, neoliberal alternatives to our economy. We need things like a living wage in places like Haiti. We need investment in infrastructure. Catherine Tanner wrote this book uh, recently, Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism. It's that kind of thing. Uh, I think that we, we, we need to have a conversation about and we need to try and find alternatives to the way things are economically and socioeconomically at the moment. And then we need an ergonomics of safety and well-being, safe build zones, building codes, building practices, people being able to afford to build, people being educated enough to know how to build. Roger Billam said again in that report in 2010, community leaders responsible for the safety of their citizens need to act on seismologist forecasts of future earthquakes based as they are on a history of repeated damage from previous events. And then we need finally a serious engagement as Christians with a politics of integrity, bold enough prophetically to call out corruption, both national and international. So these are items which serve as huge opportunities for Christians to be involved in and churches to be proactively putting people forward and encouraging their members to be involved in and to be praying about. So we come to theology. What does theology inform us about the Haiti earthquake? Well, it informs us, first of all, that earthquakes are natural. They are creations. They are not catastrophes per se, like volcanoes and hurricanes and other uh, uh, natural phenomena, as we would refer to them. And of course, they're morally neutral. They are, in fact, aesthetically wonderful. So I really bulk at the idea of conceiving of an earthquake as a natural evil. How can there be a natural evil when it's created by God, the good God, in whom is no darkness, light, no darkness. But what they do do, and in my view what God uses them to do, is to signpost moral values 
of his divine attributes. Things like his overwhelming majesty. And we, we, we see what Job thought, what he wrote about the catastrophe that he found himself in. And he, as he reflected on the, uh, the wonders of God's creation, he who removes mountains, and they know it not when he overruns, overturns them in his anger. Who shakes the earth out of its place? He's just, just so overwhelmed by the sheer majesty of God in, 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 in an event like an earthquake. And then there is the signpost to his divine wrath. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts says Isaiah, and you find similar uh, statements in, in Zechariah and Nahum, and of course, in the book of Revelation. And then earthquakes and such events have also been used to signal historic events. Isaiah writes, Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake, uh, Amos, of course, uh, setting that, but and when I read those words, I think of January the 12th, 2010. What a signal event that is from, uh, for the people of Haiti, if not for people all around the world. And then earthquakes are inspirational, worshipful wonders. I wonder how many of you, and I include myself, have been to places in the world renowned for spectacular scenery, where there are rift valleys, where there are mountains, where there are phenomena that we ooh and are ah at and love to take photographs of that are actually the products of earthquakes. So without earthquakes, we would have a very sterile earth. We would have a very boring landscape. As the psalmist said, he set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. May the glory of the Lord endure forever and the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles. Earthquakes are also pastoral comforters. The psalmist again reflects, therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the sea. And I came across that, uh, that sermon by uh, Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist uh, uh, preacher um, in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, and he entitled that, uh, that sermon, Earthquake, but not Heartquake. I thought that was, that, was, that was quite good. We will not fear, though the earth gives way. In other words, earthquakes are necessities for a sustainable planet and biosphere. They are hazardous wonders, the creator's shaping tools, along with volcanoes, hurricanes, wildflowers, floods, and are all there in the Psalms of worship. But theology also shows catastrophes as what we could call apocalypses in, in, the, in the true sense of the word. They're revelatory. They are unveiling. They pull back the curtains, as it were, on, on God's word and on human nature and societies. The Jesuit priest, the Ecuadorian Jesuit priest, Father John Sobrino, wrote a, a quite exquisite book called Where is God? And it was all about earthquakes, or at least in part it was about earthquakes, it was also about other things as well. But he said this, and this has always stayed with me, the earthquake is not just a tragedy, it is an X-ray of the country. An earthquake like a cemetery reveals the ubiquitous inequality of a society and thus its deepest truth. Some tombs are huge, sumptuous pantheons of luxurious marble in prestigious locations. Other tombs, almost without names and without crosses, are piled high in hidden places and consigned to anonymity. And when I read that, I thought again of what I saw in Haiti 
so many of those thousands who died in Haiti ended up being dumped, taken away in lorries, and dumped into mass graves, not even identified, no post-mortems, just dumped into mass graves. Professor Jonathan Wu, a friend of mine in, in uh, Whitworth, Spokane, in a book that uh, Bob White and I again edited called What Good Is God? We, gave, uh, we asked Jonathan to, 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 to write something about, uh, about the environment and about the natural world. And he said this, and I quote, there is recognition in the academic literature on disaster that events that we consider to be the causes of disaster, namely earthquakes, are more accurately described as the triggers or revealers of pre-existing situations of injustice and inequality. And Jonathan, in his book, speaks of the limits of being a human that we fail to abide by. And he compares it with the capacity of God's providence as revealed in Job chapters 38 to 41. You remember where God takes Job on this wonderful National Geographic tour introducing him to all kinds of natural phenomena that are the creations of God and that and and with God's providence there's almost no limits but if we try and if we try and think that we can be like God then we're really going to mess the world up big time and that's exactly what's happening in Haiti we have the cruel abuse of theology in those hubristic moral judgments. So many people said that what happened in Haiti was because they're black or they're Haitians. They're those black people that dared to assert themselves against the majesty of France. And all kinds of abuse have been heaped upon the Haitian people in the wake of the earthquake. Color, color issues, gender problems, class problems, even religious problems. And you think back to what our Lord said in Luke 13 when he spoke to the Pharisees who, who asked him uh, who sinned most, as it were, or what did these people do that they, uh, in other words, what did these people do wrong? that they were killed by that tower that collapsed on them or they were brutalized by the Pilate's massacre. And Jesus warned them. Jesus warned them, don't use that kind of, uh, that, that kind of framework when you're assessing people who have been, uh, who, have, who have suffered in these catastrophic events. Rather, you watch your own life and be prepared. You too, repent. And then there is the failure to seriously address the human causes of disasters, the moral and structural toxicities that are really at the root of the disasters. And then finally, the call for humility and repentance that Jesus ushered, uttered there in Luke 13, 1 to 5 and the contrasting resistance of some who will not repent. And we have that dreadful picture of the earthquake, the mountains falling on people who, have, who are asking to run into the, into the caves to hide from the wrath of God in Revelation chapter 6, 12 to 17. But theology also shows catastrophes as demanding responses of compassion and care from the church. And I've been a bit bold here because uh, I'm drawing attention to a, a book I wrote, I published back in 2013, very much with the UK in mind when it came to um, major incidents. And this is what I, I, I got my PhD in. I wrote this book, Sit on Your Hands or Stand on Your Feet. And I I draw attention to it because you go out and buy it. That, that would be great. 
but I draw attention to it because in the book, I wanted to show that theology shows catastrophes as demanding responses of compassion from the church. And I wrestled with some of the challenges in that uh, PhD research that I came across as a Christian, as an evangelical Christian, responding to a major aircraft disaster that happened just seven miles away from here on the motorway, uh, known as the Kegworth air disaster. 47 people of the, uh, uh, died in that, in that aircraft. Um, on its way from London Heathrow to, to uh, Belfast. Um, I wanted to show that there is a practical theological legitimation for Christians to be involved in whatever way their skills and gifts, God-given gifts, can allow in catastrophes, seeking to be involved, seeking to help, to bring compassion. And compassion, of course, is much more than feeling sorry for. Compassion is not compassion if it doesn't result in action. And I think there is a big field for the church, a scientifically legitimated field, a socially legitimated field, but a theologically legitimated field for people, for the people of God to be involved in catastrophes. And there is so much going on, I must add, that is already there, but there is also room for more. There is a theology of trauma, a lot of talk about trauma nowadays, but trauma in the true sense of the word. There is a theology of trauma, which I I try to address in, 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 in that book. There is a theology of common grace. Sometimes as Christians, certainly in the circles, if you like, that I was, uh, I, I inhabit, sometimes this res there's this reserve. We've got to be careful that we don't get involved with the world. Uh, we don't get political or we don't get involved with, uh, we don't do work with secular agencies. Well, if, if that's the line, then you will never get involved in showing compassion in, in, in catastrophes because catastrophes get hugely responded to by secular agencies. And they do a lot of good because of common grace. And then there's a theology of compassion. Yes, a theology of compassion, a beautiful theology of compassion, of course, exhibited supremely in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. One thinks of that so well-known parable of the Good Samaritan, which really was a story all about Jesus' heart, and the heart of God towards, uh, towards uh, catastrophized, uh, human beings. There's a theology of justice and reconciliation. And then I really stuck my neck out by saying there's a theology of ecumenical and interfaith friendship. Because again, when you're working with catastrophes, you're working with agencies, secular agencies, emergency services, but you're also working with those from other faiths because catastrophes don't just hurt Christians. They hurt people of many, many different faiths and no faith. And we have to be able to work with such people in our work of compassion and response to a catastrophe. So I'm a great believer and a great exponent for Christians responding to catastrophes Christianly and being able to work with other people. Finally, in 2018, I took this poster presentation with me to a conference in Stockholm. It was hosted by the European Geophysical Union. And I gave a presentation there. 
And after I gave the presentation, I was invited to expand on the point I was making there, that there is great value in theologians collaborating with geoscientists. So there I was, the only theologian in the room with all these geoscientists. Um, and this was because they had never heard a theologian speak to them before in, in a conference. So they said, we're not used to this. Um, we'd like you to explain why you think, what you think theology has to offer to, um, to geoscientists and the work we do. Well, I, I, took, I took the floor and, and gave an answer to that, but this was the poster that I also took along uh, and presented. I'll just leave it up there for the moment. Um, well, no, I won't. I'll go to the last slide because I have to say thank you. <laughs>